there's this paradox to Obama. On the one hand, he's praised for the Iran deal by many people who say that's a sign of a peaceful president, and there's the drones, that's a sign of an aggressive president, others say. Cuba is an interesting case study where US presidents, one after another, have taken a very hawkish stand on Cuba. Obama comes along and says, no, this isn't working. The big opening up to Cuba, which I believe you helped lead the White House effort on. Are you worried that the next president who comes along, if it's a Republican president in particular, a President Rubio or a President Trump, may undo everything you've done on Cuba, may shut down the US embassy in Havana, may stop all the opening of trade ties no, and No, because I don't think it makes any sense, because the policy we had wasn't working. If the policy is to improve the lives of the Cuban people, they overwhelmingly are welcoming this policy. It's creating new opportunities for them. So for a new president to come in and act against the wishes of the very people we're trying to help would not make any sense. For a new president to shut down an embassy uh, that, that allows us to better engage the Cuban people and better advocate on behalf of human rights would make no sense. And again, this is a question about whether or not we advance our interests more through engagement uh, or through So it's irreversible ourselves. in a sense? I think it's irreversible for a number of reasons. There's already increased commercial uh, activity. There's already increased travel. We're loosening those restrictions. The US business community, which has traditionally supported uh, the Republican Party, are enormous advocates for this change. Yeah. Republicans would have to be going against their key stakeholders in places like the Chamber of Commerce if they were Marco to Rubio, this. US Senator, Republican, wants to be the presidential candidate. He says that we tried opening up, this government, this administration tried opening up with Burma. That was a precedent for Cuba, and it hasn't worked out in Burma. The Burmese government is still oppressing minorities, is still persecuting the Rohingya Muslims in Burma. It's not a very good precedent, is it, what's happened in Burma? Look, th if the measure is perfection, Burma is not there yet. Uh, if the measure is progress, I think we have seen progress in the fact that you have more political space, you have uh, more political participation. With thousands of Rohingya fleeing, well, others locked I'm, up in camps. I'm, I'm going to get to that. It, you have an election coming up in November. You have more democratic space in Burma. But you also have significant challenges that persist. And the biggest one that we have seen is the treatment of the Rohingya uh, by uh, the, the local community in Rakhine State and the inability of the government in some cases, the willful refusal of the government uh, to stop the persecution of the Rohingya. So this is what we've said very clearly to the government is, for your democratic reforms to succeed, uh, for you to be a stable and increasingly prosperous country, you cannot treat a minority population in that way. That is only going to invite international condemnation and, and, and isolation. Aung San Suu Kyi has been heavily criticized for refusing to take a strong stance against the persecution of the Rohingya. Do you think, as a Nobel laureate, she should be saying or doing more to protect this minority, which some people are saying are on the verge of a genocide? Well, I think most importantly, she should be doing it not as a Nobel laureate, but as a political leader inside of Burma. And I think all uh, and people focus on Aung San Suu Kyi, and it's understandable that they do, but all of Burma's leaders have a responsibility to be doing more. And I think what you see is uh, people not wanting uh, to take a, a, a political stance that is unpopular in the country. But the fact of the matter is, what is happening to the Rohingya population uh, is an abomination. And, and we've been very clear uh, that there has to be... But she's the only one who can really has the credibility to say something, so you must be disappointed, she has as a, many are. She has international credibility, but inside of the country. Uh, again, I'm not saying we don't want her to speak out on this. Her voice would be very important. We want the government to act. Um, yeah. Because what you have, in many cases, is local populations uh, who are uh, persecuting the Rohingya, and government not intervening to protect uh, the Rohingya, and government not holding people accountable. What we want is humanitarian access uh, to the Rohingya. We don't want them to be in camps. We want them to be able to return uh, to their homes and villages. And we want them to be able to be citizens of Myanmar. And the fact of the matter is, the Burmese government has taken some very good steps to try to reach ceasefires and reconcile with ethnic insurgencies uh, yeah. across the country. They cannot exclude from that process uh, a minority population uh, in the Rohingya uh, simply because uh, of, of who they are and what, what they believe.